you know, if you have questions about about whatever it was that's on your uh, on your quiz, you have questions about it. You don't you don't remember seeing it somewhere. You don't see it on the uh, you know you didn't hear hear me talk about it or anything like that. You know, by all means, bring it up, and we'll make sure that we cover it. You know, in in class, uh, you know, for everybody's benefit, and uh, make sure everybody's on the same page with that. All right, so moving forward, um, we are we're going to get into chapter three here. Chapter three is as you can see, lifting and moving patients. Um, you know, probably one of the one of the biggest things that we do, uh, other than patient assessment. Um, you know, we have to get people from point A to point B, right? So sometimes that's that is uh, you know out of a danger area, right? So from let's say a a, a vehicle that's crashed, uh, you know, a burning vehicle, we need to get somebody moved to a location uh, so that they can be accessed by the ambulance. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of different scenarios that we're going to get into or that we can get into with with lifting and moving patients. Uh, with that, there is a lot of problems that can arise from that as well. So um, I can tell you and I can and I was thinking about this earlier. If you if you take uh, probably the, the three, three or four ambulances that are in this county right now and you pulled them all, you pulled them and, and you pulled them and said, hey, you know, be honest with me has you know raise your hand if you've had some type of back injury some general type of back injury from lifting or moving a patient and more than likely you're going to get several hands raised okay um <clears throat> so sometimes there is no form it, you just there's no way for you to be able to use the, the correct form that we're going to talk about it's understandable. However, you have to make try to make the best out out of that situation, and and maybe use more than one you know set of hands, or uh, you know try to use some other type of method uh, to make it easier on you to lift that patient. Uh, you know, there's uh, so that's one of those most one of the big things with this is is really try to protect yourself, lift with your legs as much as possible, uh, or lift with multiple people. Uh, you know, to really reduce that weight. Uh, again, we have, it doesn't necessarily have to be somebody that's, you know, three and 400 pounds. Okay. It doesn't have to be a, a ginormous patient for you to have that problem. Uh, you know, we can have that problem with a hundred pound patient. And so uh, it doesn't take much and, and your, your back really doesn't discriminate. I, I assure you, uh, those of you may have had back problems before, you know, some of you younger folks <laughs> hate to tell you, but it's, uh, you know, it can affect you as well. So, uh, you know, I, I've, I was a younger firefighter out on a wreck, you know, reaching over the reaching over a door and picking up on a backboard. And, uh, you know, I really wasn't lifting that far and remember pulling, pulling a muscle in my back. Uh, so it's not a, a big debilitating injury or anything like that. But over the years, I've, I've done that. I've had I've had to, you know, get in precarious positions and move patients around and uh, and had, you know, light back injuries. So uh, and there's been others that have had very serious back injuries because of that. So, again, just one of those things to be really critical about, especially when we uh, start doing it for real and uh, and make sure that you are paying attention, you know, uh, slowing, slowing that process down and making sure everybody's on the same page before we just start jerking on, on, on a stretcher or jerking on the backboard and, and trying to lift people up and down. So. So, you know, the when we when we talk about moving patients and things like that, uh, like it said, like it says here, analyzing that emergency situation that if if it's an emergency move that we're going to have to do, you know, if we don't move this patient, something bad is going to happen to them. Right. Uh, so we need to that may be one of those things where we have to evaluate it pretty quickly and make and just make that um, that command decision to do that. So we want to quickly evaluate the, the patient's condition, whether it's if we can talk to them or we can try to look at the mechanism of injury, which is which is what caused them to have this injury and see, uh, see, hey, is this going to be safe for us to do so? Or is the patient's life in danger enough that we need that it doesn't matter what's wrong with them? We have to get them out of here. Right. So to carry out an effective life saving emergency medical procedure. And that's again, that's what we we're just talking about. So some of the things, again, to keep in mind is doing no further harm to the patient. We mentioned this Monday, I'm sorry, Tuesday, about 
you know, that's probably one of the, that's the, one of the biggest things that we don't want to do is cause further harm. Right. So uh, when you move that patient, do it only when necessary. You know, we don't need to move them a bunch of times when we get in a patient assessment, especially trauma assessment. Uh, we're going to we're going to roll the patient over. We're going to cut all their clothes off, all this sort of stuff. And we're going to be looking around for things. Well, we don't want to do that a ton of times. We really want to try to be uh, for one. It's, it's just inefficient. And then two, it could be detrimental to a spinal mobilization and things of that nature. So we want to try to roll that patient, move that patient only when really necessary. Uh, so we and again, like I said, as few times as possible. When we do that, we try to, you, you know, even if they're, we don't suspect a head or neck injury, uh, we try to, you, you know, move their body as a unit. So we're not just going to like bend them in half or bend them sideways or whatever, trying to trying to drag them over onto a board. Uh, you know, when we do that, we really want to try to, you know, keep them as straight as line as possible, pick them up, move them together and not drag one, the top part of the body and then drag the bottom part of the body, things like that. So again, using proper lifting and moving techniques, which we'll get into, and then have one rescuer give commands. Typically, the way it works, uh, it, the person that is in control of the head, uh, which we'll get in a you know head manual stabilization here in a little bit. That is, you know, that's usually the person that is calling the shots. It's just a standardized way of having people, uh, having everybody understand. Hey, doesn't matter if there's a paramedic at the feet and a you know a first responder at the head. It, it doesn't matter. OK, it, it, it's just a simple technique. We're not doing anything invasive, but everybody's going to go on your call. One, two, three, lift, and then that, then we're going to move. And so it's the person at the head who's going to make that call. So other things to consider, uh, delay moving the patient if possible until additional EMS personnel arrive. So, again, if it's not one of these detrimental situations, these not emergency situations that we're not really too concerned about, you know, even if we're down in you know, down in the woods somewhere or whatever. If they're fine where they're at, leave them be, okay? It's not going to harm anything uh, to, for them to be there, it, then it's no problem. Uh, we'll get them the appropriate method of transportation up, you know, up and out of the woods, and uh, and we'll do it there instead of us trying to throw something together real quick and it not be the right thing. You know, the ambulance comes with, uh, with several different ways to lift and move patients. So, you know, we'll get into that, some of that too. And so it's one of those things where, again, if it's not if it's not a safety issue, leave them there and let's get the right way to uh, right method to move them. It says do not step over the patient. Uh, it's kind of a, just a general it's a general rule. It's not hard and fast. You know, we have uh, there's just situations and there's actual techniques that we're going to talk about tonight where you actually straddle the patient. Um, it's just not something that we want to make it a habit. Uh, however, it is something that you will find yourself doing occasionally. So don't, uh, you know, it's not, it's not one of these big freak out things if you see somebody straddling the patient, but if they're doing it consistently, you know, constantly and things like that, it's, uh, it could be an issue. So biggest thing is, you know, we have, especially when we're, if we're, if it's over their upper half around their head and stuff like that, we have things in our pockets. We have, uh, you know, we have scissors and all sorts of, sort of stuff that we have hanging off of us and stethoscopes and, um, you know, so we don't want to drop stuff on their face. You know, we don't want to drop stuff on their body. Um, and we also, it lends yourself to, to kind of trip or, or, or if you, for some, for some reason you slip or something like that. Now you're right on top of the patient. You could, you're going to fall on top of them. So, uh, just kind of like I said, kind of a general rule. It's not, you know, again, sometimes it does happen where you have to straddle the patient. So. Anytime we are moving the patient, uh, we try to explain to them what we're doing. And we do that throughout, regardless whether we're moving them, moving them or not. If our if our patient is conscious or, or semi-conscious, um, you know, it's a good idea to at least give them that information. <clears throat> Patients who are incoherent that are not completely with it can still hear, okay? So don't – you always have to remember that. If you are sitting there at, at the patient's side and there's a bunch of stuff going on and, you know, you, you know, whether you know it or not or, or doesn't matter. But if, you, if you're saying stuff like, oh, man, they really don't look good. I think this one's going to die. You know, stuff like that. You know, that patient might hear you remember it. And when they wake up in a few hours in the hospital 
or a few days later and they they might remember that and go hey what you know or or, or some other you know some other comments could be made you know that are detrimental uh that just shouldn't be said and you think that you know you're saying it to just your your buddy or your partner and this patient is actually hearing you so uh, always be cognizant about what you're saying and how you're saying it, who you're saying it to uh, on on some of these scenes. One from a legal standpoint, which we'll talk about, uh, you know, next Tuesday. But that's, um, you know, those are those are things you always have to take into consideration. So keep the rules of good body mechanics in mind. Know your from physical limitations, you know. Um, you know, there there are some of you that are, are smaller and there are some of you that are bigger and stronger and taller and have more, you know, lift capability, right? So uh, some of you work out, some of you don't. Some of you do, you know, lift patients all the time and some of you don't. So it's, uh, it really is, uh, you know, everybody has their limitations and that's fine. It's it's okay to ask for help or say, hey, I, I don't think I can do that. Um, you know, and there there'll be times where you may have to, you're doing one of these emergency, you know, drags or carries or something like that. And, you know, it's somebody that far outweighs you or is, is just much bigger than you. And, um, you know, and you have to try to do what you can do, but you know, it's one of those things that you, you, that's just it. You're, you're doing whatever you can do. And, it, and again, if you need to ask for help, you need to do that. Keep yourself balanced. Uh, again, like I said, you mentioned about straddling the patient and falling over, you know, that sort of thing happens too, especially when, or, or we're, you know, we're trying to get out of some of these uh, wreck scenes out in the woods and we got cut off trees, we got debris, we have all the stuff we're trying to step over and balance and move around. And so uh, just one of those things that uh, try to keep yourself on balance and watch, re watch your footing. You know, if we have extra people around, always a great thing to do if you're not working on something and they're like people are having to transport patients down steps, especially. Um, you know, hey, stand behind that person with their back to the steps and walk them down. Hold a little back, hold a little forward pressure on their back and kill, call the steps out to them. Hey, two steps left, one step left. All right, we're on the ground. All right, good. You know, and those types of things just help give that person a peace of mind that, hey, I'm not going to fall backwards and, and, you know, crack my head open and have this patient come tumbling down on top of me. Right. Hey, uh, Justin. Yeah. We, we missed. Uh... We missed a little part about what you said. Uh, I don't know. Something with the audio went bad. We missed a little bit of what you said. Okay. What'd you leave off at? You cut off right after uh, the some of us with weights and talking about different body styles and all. Okay. So, so what I was getting getting at, if you if you you know following along there, so talking about being balanced, it, you know, staying on balance is is uh, it could be a lot of different things. It could go being balanced in the ambulance. Being, being pulled around while they're driving or from, uh, you know, being out here on some of the scenes and stuff where, you know, there's a lot of, you know, uneven terrain and all this sort of, sort of stuff. Uh, stairs is one of them. So going up and down stairs and, uh, you know, talking about holding pressure against somebody's back and walking them down, helping them down the stairs. You know, it, you don't have to be, you know, uh, you know, cocky about it or whatever, like, oh, I don't need help. I can, I can tote this patient down these stairs or whatever. Well, you know, if you're walking backwards downstairs, you know, it's just an unsafe thing to, you know, to be, to be doing anyway, even though it has to be done. But, um, you know, it's good to have somebody spotting you at the, at the bottom of the stairs. That's what I was getting at was, uh, you know, always have you a spotter, you know, and try to help keep you, keep you balanced when you're working on stairs. So maintain a firm footing kind of goes with that. Uh, lift and lower the patient by bending, um, by bending your legs and not your back. And that's by you know that's one of the things you always hear. Oh, lift with your legs, not your back. Lift with your legs, not your back. That is you know that that's absolutely correct. I mean it's just good body mechanics. Um, you know if those of you who've ever lifted weights or you know did any type of squatting or anything like that, that's legitimately what you're what you're going to be doing. Um, if, uh, you know, you're essentially going to be cleaning that, um, that stretcher or, you know, if it, or backboard. So, you know, getting a good, you know, a good, uh, flat, you know, get your feet nice and flat, you know, shoulder a little more than shoulder width apart, you know, roll your shoulders back, lock your, lock your arms out and, um, 
you know, and bent and, you know, try to put your uh, body just a little bit forward and you're, and you're going to, you know, come straight up off the ground. You're not, you're not going to be bent all the way over trying to lift with your back. Uh, again, we'll get a little bit more of this in a little bit. Try to keep your arms close to your body. So especially if you're, you know, when you're working with like, say, a, a backboard or a, a sheet or something like that, if you have a patient in a sheet, you know, want to try to keep your, uh, keep your arms close to your core. And that helps, to, you know, it's a little more strong that way. And then also helps with your balance. All right. So as the closer we bring it into the core, the stronger we are. And again, like we said before, move that patient as few times as possible. So the recovery position, uh, those of you who've had CPR, uh, you may have seen this. <clears throat> Excuse me. The recovery position, also known as the left or right lateral recumbent. Uh, so that's the technical name for it. If, uh, you know, if your patient, regardless of what, you're, what is going on, if your patient happens to be unconscious, uh, you know, it's probably it's sometimes and they don't have a, a head or neck injury. It's a good idea to, to put them in the recovery position, especially if they're still breathing. They have a pulse, all that sort of stuff. But for some reason, they're just unconscious. Um, it's not a bad and you're waiting around maybe for uh, the ambulance or something of that nature, especially somebody who's just had a seizure, you know, things of that nature. You know, we can put them in this recovery position uh, kind of keeps their airway open. Uh, allows any kind of secretions to drain out of their mouth and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. You can kind of manage their airway a little bit better that way. The um, and the the key points of that, as you can see, is that the uh, top knee is bent, okay, and it's out in front like that. And then, as you can see, he's kind of like lay, like kind of like you would be sleeping almost, and you lay in, uh, you're laying on your side. And you run their hand up underneath their head like that, and uh, so it kind of props their head up just and props their neck up just a little bit, and gives them kind of like a little kickstand. Okay, so that's that's essentially the recovery position, whether you're on the left or right side. Can y'all still hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So talking about body mechanics, um, you know, improper lifting or moving techniques can result in injury uh, to you or to the patient. Uh, you know, again, I've, we've had plenty of times where, unfortunately, uh, you know, people have stumbled. People have, uh, you know, been going up a hill and then slipped. I mean, just face planted, been pushing the stretcher up the hill and face planted. Now all the weight is on the person who's on the other end. Um you know, backboards, you know, trying to move backboards to the stretcher. So having a backboard up the hill, all that sort of stuff. Those things are, you know, those things can be super detrimental. I mean, luckily, I don't, I, in my career, I haven't had a patient like, you know, flip over and go flying or whatever. But I've had them, you know, be in a precarious position, both on a backboard and on, a on the stretcher. So, um, you know, we had to kind of, you know, scramble to try to, you know, secure it and, and, and get some uh, get some hands on it. So uh, it can happen to anybody, you know. And again, a lot of times, especially wrecks and things like that, you know, they happen when it's raining. So you know, the ground's going to be wet, slippery. Uh, the vehicle may have created a more slippery surface by kicking up mud and dirt and all that. So um, so there's definitely uh, potential for for these issues uh, at, at any call. But, you know, we were on one um, just last week. Yeah, last week, uh, not too far from my house, actually. Uh, and it was a house up on stilts. And uh, no, they hadn't pressure washed in a long time. So there was an overdose. And his deck was, co was somewhat covered. And so uh, it was super slimy, slick. I mean, just super slick wood. And, uh, I mean, people were just going skating everywhere and we had to put him on a flexible stretcher and had to have four of us to, to make it down the stairs just inch by inch. So we wouldn't slip and fall. Um, you know, and that's just a very real possibility. And sometimes you have to maybe wait if the, if it's, you know, if it's viable for the patient to wait, uh, a little bit so that you can get that extra help. So it's safe for you to, to be able to move. So keep your back straight as you lift. Like I, like I said, you know, roll those shoulders back. Um, you know, bend your bend at the waist just ever so slightly. Try not to twist 
again, something that's, you know, sometimes it's hard, it's hard not to do, uh, you know, you just get in these positions, these patients get in these positions, uh, and, and every, every way you can think of, and, uh, and you may have to do that. Uh, but again, if you have the ability, if you, if you're going to need to lift and twist, see if you can lift and twist with, you know, another person helping you, you know, uh, so that you, you're taking some of that weight off of you. Uh, ensure that you have a firm footing, like we mentioned earlier, before you start to move the patient. You know, like I said, it, it could you can be in all these different types of uh, crazy, you know, wet, muddy conditions, and uh, and it doesn't matter where you step, where you put your foot. It's you know, it's going to be muddy. So uh, you have to maybe I've, I've had to like literally put my foot against somebody else's foot, you know, that sort of thing uh, to keep it from slipping. You know, I've had to put, have had to use tools. You know, I've put my foot. I've taken the, you know, the extrication tools and basically jammed them in the ground and used them as, as, uh, footers. Uh, you have done that with hand tools, you know, off the fire truck, you know, so, uh, you just never know. I mean, you try to, try to be creative and you try to, you try to do the best you can with what you have, uh, while using good body mechanics. So again, obviously you want to assess the weight of the patient and know your physical limitations like we were mentioning. Call for additional personnel, uh, personnel if needed. Those of you who are already uh, in public safety, you've probably heard it on the radio. Hey, you know, the ambulance needs assistance with lifting somebody, right? Uh, hey, such and such fire department needs needs some more hands out here to to, to lift, uh, you know, things like that. So it, 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 it absolutely is necessary, and, and it's not, uh, you know, I, I've, I've been a part of it. I've seen it. I've heard it for years and years, you know, where, where somebody gets, you know, ridiculed or, talk bad about because they ask for help or they ask for assistance or whatever, you know, don't worry about that. You know, it's not, it's not worth worrying about that. If you need help lifting somebody or moving somebody or whatever, you just don't feel like you can do it. Then call for help. Don't, don't throw your back out. Don't, you know, don't risk your career uh, with some type of serious injury uh, because you're prideful. Okay. It's just not worth that. Communicate with other members, um, you know, the lifting team, that's just one of those things, like we said before, you know, designate somebody to kind of call it, usually the person at the head and, um, and you know, make sure everybody's set. All right, everybody ready to go. Everybody's got their hands on it. Everybody got a good footing. Yep. All right. We're good. All right. We're lifting on three and we're going and, 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 you know, mark a location. Hey, we're going, we're going to go here and we're going to go around that tree up the hill right there on the dry spot, you know, something like that. Or we're going to go over here to the left. They have, they cut a trail for us, you know, whatever it is make sure everybody understands where we're going because it, it never fails when you start doing that and you don't, you know, when you don't do that, um, you're going to have somebody who doesn't understand, wasn't paying attention, you know, wasn't listening and you're going to have them, uh, you know, pulling away from you going somewhere else or, uh, who's not really sure where, you know, where to hold or where to grab or whatever. So make sure everybody's good and set before you just start taking off. And then again, practice lifting moves. Nothing wrong with that, right? So, I mean, you know, we're going to do skills at some point, but uh, that's not that's not where it ends. You know, any of these, any for those of you that are in the fire service and and law enforcement and things like that, it, you know, make that part of your training. You know, if it's just you know taking how to how to put a patient in a, in a different type of uh, you know transport device, backboard or scoop stretcher or KED, any of the things that we're going to talk about tonight, you know. Practice those things. Put them in there. You know, they're not always glamorous or sexy or, you know, whatever. And it doesn't have to be. Uh, and it, it could take 30 minutes, you know, something like that. You know, put somebody in a vehicle or put somebody in some kind of precarious position and say, all right, let's package them and get them out of here. You know, and uh, just, again, going through the motions like that will help identify issues and refresh your memory about how some of these pieces of equipment work and all that. So like we said early on, there are times where we're going to have to move that patient in an emergency, situ emergency situation, regardless of what's wrong with them, regardless of how bad off they are. If we leave them there, they're going, they're going to die. So, you know, something really bad is going to happen to them. So we need to move them now. So big things, uh, big considerations with that is the danger of fire, explosion or structural collapse. Um, and that could be, you know, 
a vehicle that's partially on a on a tree hanging on a tree and uh at any moment it could slide down the hill and flip over and over and over and over right so that would be something that kind of would go along with structural collapse <clears throat> excuse me um you know somebody that's potentially going to fall or you know things of that nature as well uh hazardous materials are present you know so obviously we have to adjust for whether or not we could even be there uh can we be there in that hazardous materials environment and then actually get the patient out if not then unfortunately we're going to have to hang out in the in the good air back here and wait until we either have the right equipment on ppe on or uh we you know the, the area is deemed safe for us to go in and do something about it so the uh, the emergency scene cannot be uh protected and again that may be one of those things where if we if we got in there and all of a sudden we realized we didn't know it until we got there or got inside or got got wherever the patient is and realized oh man this is not good you know this is this this we can't control whatever's going on here well let's at least try to get their patient out of this location um and that could be anything so for for the cops in the room that's you know people that are in there that you're are shot or, or or that are injured or something like that and you don't know where the threat is you know if you can move if you you can move the patient and yourself to position of cover we're doing double good right so that would be um that would be another you know potential scenario uh it's otherwise impossible to gain access uh, to other patients who need life-saving care <clears throat> the patient has experienced cardiac arrest um you know those are that's one of those things where you know again realistically uh they are clinically dead uh you know for, for all intents and purposes and we're gonna you know we, we have a, a pretty short window to be able to do something about it and we need to get them out of there so that we can uh we can start affecting you know some type of actual um you know aid for for a cardiac arrest so going into drags you know there's a lot of things again it just depends on the environment that you're in how you want to how and why you would want to drag somebody um you know in tactical ems we do we talk a lot about drags just because a lot of times it's it's us that's doing it um and so we have to kind of do it pretty quickly uh we have you know bullets and bombs you know going off or whatever and so we need to we, a lot of our drags are emergency drags in the direct threat care phase uh that we operate in but there are uh plenty of other reasons i mean you know we might get called to a nursing home or to a hospital you know clinic or something like that where people are bed bound and we need to drag them uh you know for the firefighters in the room you probably heard you know, probably you've, you've dealt with drags and carries before and it's it's no different uh than that but a lot of times it is uh more on the emergency side we really need to get them you know to a place where the atmosphere is better the location is safer that sort of thing uh so the simplest way is the best way you know just whatever whatever works works you know everybody's clothing is different size different the material on which you drag them on or the, the surface on which you drag them on is really going to be a big deciding factor you know that carpet that they're on right there you know probably not too bad for for normal street clothes and stuff uh, especially if he was in a sheet or something he'd probably he'd probably slide all around there uh thicker carpet it's it's a lot harder uh you know some of these uh rough surfaces you know that have you know limbs and stumps and this and that and all, you know just all these different little things that are on, that are in the way um you know it's going to be a lot harder so uh, there is, uh, there's definitely, it just really depends on the environment that you're in and, and what you have to drag them with or on. So, you know, in, in the manner that, that they're doing right now, it's called the clothes drag. And that, that's, again, you're just using their clothes to do that, to, to, to do that drag. You know, again, if they had like a big jacket on, you know, you could potentially take that jacket, uh, off of them wrap it around wrap it around them and use it almost like a handle you know so there's a lot of different little ingenious ways that you can use the patient's clothing uh to um to help you pull and drag uh, again if you have a problem lifting that patient up that's uh it, it's going to be hard 
the big thing that we want to try to do is reduce friction. So whenever we're, whenever we're in this position and we basically lift them up, we want to try to get them as high up, you know, to us as we can and, uh, and try to drag them that way. So maybe it's just the legs that are on the ground instead of, you know, their whole back and things like that. So cardiac rest, cardiac patients and the closed drag, uh, if the room in, in which you find the patient is not large enough, move the patient. Uh, this is what we're, we're mentioning about, you know, we don't want to do CPR. If those of you have been CPR, we don't want to do CPR on a bed or a couch or a recliner or something like that. We really want to pull them on down to a hard surface. <clears throat> so, you know, if there's two of you, that's great. We can just kind of do a two person carry, pick them up, put them on the floor. But if there's one of you, depends on the location, we're probably going to have to lift them up and try to basically lower them down to the ground. So um, that is uh, that's pretty tough. And, and also, you know, people just like this kind of depicted here, there are plenty of people uh, who have uh, cardiac history, especially will um, let's call it have a vago maneuver. And that vago maneuver a lot of times happens when they are going to defecate when they're using the bathroom. So that um unfortunately we have patients that are usually in the bathroom you know when they uh have their heart attack and so they're unconscious in a tight space and we need to get them to a location where we can actually work on them uh so getting them so if you're first responder and you you get there first that's you know that's probably one you know a big a, a big help to everybody is going to be for you to relocate that patient to a, a location that is going to be uh, easier for everybody to start doing what they're doing. Think about the the paramedic having to lay down and intubate that patient. Uh, you know, think about people having to be on both sides doing CPR, starting IVs. You know, all this other sort of stuff. Um, you know, so think about that when you're when you're going into that patient movement phase, and and where can we get a, a good location for that all that stuff to happen. So the blanket drag, like we were mentioning, is uh, is a pretty convenient way. You know, we we lift and drag people with blankets a good bit of the time that are bed bound, especially, uh, or that are just in a bed and can't move on their own. And so we will, um, you know, we're literally just take the sheets off their bed. So whatever they're laying on, if it's a fitted sheet that has elastic, you know, or if it has uh, some kind of, uh, you know, just a, a, a Another, some of them have draw sheets, you know, depends on the, the patient, you know, uh, elderly patients that are bed bound will have a draw sheet, which is essentially a, a sheet that we can lift and move the patient with. But the, uh, you know, any other sheet that's underneath them, we just roll it off the, you know, roll it off the mattress and pick them up with that. Basically make them into a little, you know, burrito or, I mean, a taco or a cocoon or whatever and pick them up and, um, and move them where we want to move them. So if we, you know, this again would be one that we would use for, you know, nursing homes, hospitals, you know, so in the event of a potential fire or something, some of that nature, we can drag them off the bed uh, with the blanket and the blanket may have a little bit more surface area to it. Uh, maybe it won't snag as easy and we can, uh, we can get them, get them where we want to go. And we could also, again, if we, if we get multiple hands available, we can put, you know, we could have four people, one in each corner of the blanket and, and uh, distribute that weight and do a, a better carry that way if, we, if we're going to transition to a carry. So arm to arm, um, this is a, an important one to understand. Uh, when you're doing this, it, it needs to be done a certain way. And this is one that we use in EMS a lot. So um, good, good chance that you're probably going to, you know, lift somebody like this and, uh, you know, you may drag them, but more than likely you're going to actually lift them this way as well. So a two person, this is usually a two person carry or two person lift uh, method, you know, part of the two person uh, carry method. And same way, we're going to kind of get in a squatting position. So if they're laying down, we're going to take their head, take their shoulders, roll them up, put them in the sitting position with their feet straight out. When we do that, we need to kind of put a knee in their back and uh, keep them sitting upright if they can't sit upright on their, on their own and hold them upright reach our hands underneath their armpits all right and grab their wrists grab their wrists 
and then it hasn't they haven't quite done it yet in this and it depends on the length of your arms but we want to really push them kind of get them hunched over a little bit and reach all the way down as far as we can we want to get our chest right up against their back all right and get our arms all the way in there and cross you take their take our hands and and make their hands cross each other okay what that's going to help do is lock in your hands to their hands and their hands to their body okay um so when you do that, you're going to be right on them. You, your, your, your chest is going to be touching their back, and you're going to be in a full squat position, okay? And that's where you need to start from to either raise or drag or whatever. When you stand up, you know, don't, don't you know, raise your butt in the air and then try to lift with your back. You need to try to pick that patient up and bring them and keep them up there next to your chest and keep as mu and get as much of their body weight off the ground as you possibly can. Uh, that way, again, we can have maximum height if we're just lifting and putting transferring them over to a stretcher or something. Or if we're going to drag them, we have as little friction as friction as possible dragging on the ground because we're going to be moving backwards if it's one person, okay? Which is what it's depicting in this picture. So, the firefighter drag. Uh, I mean, this is just what they call it. So you know, just remember it this way for now. But um, I haven't been a firefighter for a very long time. This is not what this is called, but, um, you know, there are, there's like, again, there's a lot of different ways to do stuff. And this is something that, you know, it has a couple of different uses. If for some reason you find yourself in like a, a, a smoke filled environment, you know, you have, uh, maybe you need to get cover. So for those of you in law enforcement, you know, stuff like that, or, or, or somebody might be operating on a, uh, a rescue task force, you know, you might find yourself in a position where you really need to kind of get get low and get your, keep your patient low and not be such of a target. So uh, you could use, you know, tape or you could use, you know, some, something, some way to tie their hands this way. And this is, again, for the unconscious patient and um, and put it around your neck and you would just be in that crawling position and just drag them. It is not fast at all. It is not easy at all. So, uh, again, it's just a, it's just a tool for the toolbox, you guys. It's not something that you know we do hardly ever. Uh, but again, it's just an option out there. So, if you find yourself in that unique position and you need it, you need an option to pull from. This is this is one of those to keep a low profile and uh, and slowly get your patient from point A to point B. So emergency drag from the vehicle, talking about one rescuer, uh, again, grab, grasp the patient under the arms, <clears throat> excuse me, and cradle the patient's head between your arms, uh, put, pull the patient down into a horizontal position as you ease him or her from the vehicle. So pretty self-explanatory, you know, you're really just going to kind of get up underneath them in the front there uh, and then pull their upper body uh, out and down onto the ground. And once you get them on the ground, uh, then we can kind of start doing a, you know, that one rescuer, um, you know, drag that we had talked about just a moment ago. Similar to this. But before you let them fall down to the ground, it'd be good to go ahead and reach through, grab their wrists, okay, cross them, and then do what we were just talking about. So two rescuers, uh, you know, again, similar, similar, very similar, but before we do that, we're going to, uh, you know, that second rescuer is going to move and pick up the patient uh, on the other end. So uh, the patient is removed with the head, neck stabilized in a neutral position and use a long backboard if time per permits. So again, if we just, if we have access to them and we can get them out pretty quick and we have a backboard there to transfer them to, um, you know, whether or not we have to kind of like pick them up real quick and then put them on the backboard or if we could just slide them right onto it. Uh, just depends. But if time doesn't permit, again, this thing is on fire, it's going to blow up, you know, whatever, then, uh, then we just need to, again, do that one person, two person drag, get them out of there. So the two person extremity carry, which is, you know, similar to what we were just talking about with the two person exit from the vehicle. Uh, this is kind of what you'll end up with once you get, once you get them out there with two people. And as you can see, he has reached through there from the back. Uh, has her back up against his chest and um, and has reached through and has grabbed her wrists. Okay. Again, it's important 
to try to cross those arms, all right, cross, cross their arms across their arms and your hands across the front of their chest. If your grip starts failing, your biceps and triceps start failing, then those, those hands are going to slowly creep down, creep down, creep down by their side. And then you're going to end up basically putting them into uh, looking like you're going to put them in handcuffs while they're hanging upside down. Okay. So we don't want that to happen. Right. Uh, it's going to probably dislocate their shoulder and, and you may even drop them because of that and stuff like that. So again, just be cautious of that and try, try your best to keep those hands out in front of the patient. Uh, again, if you feel like you're going to, you know, you need to reposition or drop the patient or whatever, tell your partner, stop, hang on. I have to reposition. I'm going to drop them. You know, let's, let's uh, lower the patient together, reposition, get another, get a better grip and let's move forward. Uh, but again, the other big thing with this, is the location of where the front partner is. So the female uh, uh, EMT or whatever in the front here is at the knee level. She's not at the feet. Now there's a couple of different ways to do this. So we'll just, we'll kind of go with this. We'll go with this method. Uh, but if you're going to do it this way, you need to be back there at the knees, let their, especially if they're unconscious, let their, you know, limp lower leg fall over your forearms. So, uh, a good method, again, just kind of depends on how big you are versus how wide their legs are and all this other stuff. But try to reach in there and uh, and grab a hold of either the underneath of their knees or reach through and grab your hands and hold them together. Uh, and that way, the legs actually kind of lock around your arms. All right. The lower leg and the knee kind of flops down and, and uh, locks around your arm. Uh, just another method to create friction to help keep uh, the patient from slipping. Okay. Again, not uh, not very complicated. Just one of those things that you need to be coordinated with, because um, you can you can make it really hard on yourself. Um, you know, there's plenty of videos out there, plenty of pictures out there from some of these big chaotic scenes and stuff where people are are having to do emergency moves for people, and I mean, it is just horrible to watch because they are just messing it up big time, and they are just killing themselves, their back, their partners, their you know, the patients are suffering because of it. I mean, it's just all sorts of crazy stuff. Now, when we start throwing in, especially on the emergency side, when we start throwing in blood and body fluids and all these other types of things, rain, you know, things of that nature, fluids that may have come from something else. I mean, who knows what have, what exploded in the car during the wreck or, you know, what they were doing <laughs> prior to, to you getting there. Uh, you know, you could have all sorts of different things, you know, on their body and everything else. So they're, they're just going to be slippery, uh, inherently because of some of that. So, uh, you know, not a bad idea, you know, wipe them down, dry them off, you know, just the areas that you're going to need to grab a hold of and make sure they're not going to slip out of your hands, especially if we're going to have to go a pretty decent distance. <clears throat> Two person seat carry, uh, you know, it, it's essentially, you just grab each other's, uh, hands like that. And your the patient can kind of either sit in there, and you know it, it's pretty much that simple. It really is somebody that's non ambulatory, but is also able to assist you, uh, as you can tell here on the right hand picture where she's able to kind of hold on, you know, put her arms around their their uh, their neck like that, maybe hold on, uh, stuff like that. So, or she can be helped to a standing position, but can't actually walk. Um, you know, so we would want to have her. Um, you know, help us out a little bit there. So cradle and arms carry, obviously this is more for a child or infant. Um, you know, we try to kneel beside them. It's, it's pretty, pretty uh, self-explanatory, you know, just like you would hold any other child, um, you know, that's, you know, going to sleep or you're carrying them from, you know, falling asleep on the couch to the bed or whatever. Right. So some, anything similar to that. But uh, but again, trying to trying to also hold their head so their head's not bobbing, especially infants and babies. Uh, we don't want their head bobbing around. They're not quite fully developed yet, and it can be detrimental to their neck. The two person chair carry uh, again, another you know kind of pretty inventive little way to utilize your environment. If you have you know, the rolling spinning chair is not necessarily the best one to use in this method. Uh, however, those chairs are great because you can sit somebody in there and just roll them around. So if the surface is, you know, an office building or whatever, and they're already in a rolling chair, just 
roll them around, right? So have, make sure a couple people are holding on to them so they don't tip over or hit something and tip over. But, you know, that's absolutely a, a method to do that. Or, or if you, you know, you find that in the area that you're in, there maybe they don't have to be sitting in it, but you can pick them up long enough to put them in the chair and then roll the chair around. So similar, similar way to doing this uh, would be that you have a good sturdy four leg chair and <clears throat> somebody gets behind, whether it has a, a bar going across the back, you could, you could grab it there, kind of tilt them back a little bit more. Um, or, and then the other person is going to grab the two front legs and, uh, and you can go that way. You could also turn around and do this if it's, if it's easier and the patient legs, patient's legs aren't, uh, you know, too close up to you, but, um, definitely an option for you. This is a, this is another one that, um, they invented the stair chair, uh, because of this and several different versions out there, but essentially a folding chair, uh, that had, that goes, goes on the ambulance. Usually it's by the back door, uh, or under the seat and it will, uh, it folds out and you put the patient on there and it's uh, a little bit easier to get up and down stairs. Some of them have like little, uh, treads, almost like a tank. Okay. And those treads will actually ride on the, the treads of the, uh, stairs. So, uh, they sit there in a seated position like that. And, but you have a much more smoother, uh, ride down the steps. So, uh, again, that two rescuer, uh, chair method is, uh, is, you know, works wonders for, for even just carrying, you know, all over the place, but, uh, even up and down stairs. The backpack carry again, usually somebody who's unconscious or they could be conscious, I guess, just to kind of depends on their situation, uh, but they're non ambulatory, so they can't walk. And, uh, you know, if you can get them up in, into the starting position, if they're, if they're unconscious, that's probably the hardest part. Uh, you know, biggest thing is going to have them in a seated position. So if you can push them up into a seated position, hold them there, get around in front of them, grab their arms, put them around your shoulders, getting, get in a squat position and then stand up. Um, you know, that's going to be, you know, probably the, the easiest way to, uh, have them, uh, you know, have them stabilized on you while you stand up. If they're able to kind of, again, one of those things where you can, if they can stand up, but they can't walk, this could be another one of those options for you. So, hey, all right, I'm going to help you up. All right, lock your knees out, stand up, I'm going to pull you up, and then I'm going to turn around and put you on my back. You know, that sort of thing. Direct ground lift, again, used to move a patient who is on the ground or the floor to an ambulance stretcher. Uh, should be used only for those patients who have not sustained a traumatic injury. <laughs> Excuse me, we'll see these uh, here in a little bit, some of these uh, skill drill uh PowerPoint slides. Transferring a patient from the bed to a stretcher, you know, so from the bed to the stretcher or the stretcher to the hospital bed, um, it's pretty much the same way. Usually you place the, you try to get the stretcher as high, you know, as even with the bed as we can. Uh, again, loosen that bottom sheet or either put a sheet underneath them and log roll them onto the blanket or sheet. And then we will, um, you know, we're going to, again, try to get somebody at the feet in the head, maybe somebody in the middle. And then on the person at the head's count, we'll pick them straight up and straight over. It's one fluid motion. Everybody here still hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, good then. All right, so this is kind of that tra that bed transfer. Just kind of a couple pictures here. Like I said, having the having the stretcher side by side with the bed, uh, you know, undo the sheets or or whatever it is you're going to be used to moving them on, and uh, having some people on one side. And we, you know, sometimes you have to get, like like kind of like they are here on this bottom picture. Sometimes you're up in the bed with them and everything else. So just be cautious of what's in the bed, what's around the bed. We were at a an overdose and the other day, and uh, you know we we're basically about to get up in the bed with them and we started moving them around uh once we kind of got them back awake and we started moving them around and found you know 
uncapped needles and capped needles and all this other sort of stuff, you know, up up amongst the blankets and sheets and all that sort of stuff. So just be mindful of where you're crawling into, you know, some place you've never been, somebody else's house. So you never know what's going on, what they were doing before before all this happened. So just make sure that you are you're aware of, of your surroundings before you just start jumping up in places. So walking assists uh, for for patients, um, the one person walking assist, you know, we've probably seen it before. You probably helped somebody do it like this before. It's pretty simple. You just put their arm around, you know, they can walk, but not very well. They just need a, you know, they need some support. So um, uh, putting their arm around your neck and then holding their wrist and then you see his hand kind of coming around his waist there. The other, the other way is just if they have a belt is to hold their belt. Um, you know, that's another, another way to kind of help give a little bit of support from the rear like that. Two person, uh, again, similar, similar method there. Uh, we're going to overlap our arms in the back and make sure we either, you know, grab a pocket or grab the belt, something like that, and make sure that they don't, uh, they don't just, if they do happen to slip out of our hand, that they don't just go falling forward. All right, I've been going for about an hour now. You guys take 10 minutes. Come on back um, at, uh, yeah, about 10 minutes.
All right. Coming back. I made it. Yay. All right. So, again, those of you who may have been around some ambulances here, you know, before, um, you know, or, or, over the years, maybe, you know, you've probably seen an evolution of, of stretchers. Uh, the wheeled ambulance stretcher has really come a long way. I mean, it's, it's come leaps and bounds. Now the, the freaking thing is, is battery operated, you know, so uh, in, in a lot of places. And, uh, you know, it really, it really helps save, you know, just like we said, some of these back injuries and, and issues that we have with lifting the stretcher, which, you know, it has weight to it, obviously, uh, in and of itself. But then also, it, uh, you know, then you have the weight of the patient, right? So <clears throat> that was uh, really one of the big things when when our ambulance crews, especially, were, were you know, lifting a patient with a traditional stretcher, it... Uh, you know, you really had to, you know, watch what you were doing. You, you, you'll you seriously hurt your back doing that. Um, so, you know, you want to be on a good level surface when you try to do, be on a good level surface when you're actually lifting the patient up. You know, a lot of times when we're kind of going over rough terrain with the stretcher, you know, we kind of, we may not leave it all the way up. We, we kind of bring it about, about halfway so it's not quite as top heavy. Some of these stretchers, We'll have uh, bars that pull out, so um, basically assist bars. So if you have a heavy, heavy patient or a rough, like I said, rough terrain, the bars will just pull out of the center. You can hold on to it, and two other people can hold on to it, and you have two people on the, on the ends and, uh, you know, help keep it laterally stable. So this one is a version of the, a version of the newer one, the new Striker XPS type stretcher. Uh, you know, again, there's tons of different manufacturers out there, different types of stretchers uh, for different things. But uh, if, if you look down there at the foot down, you can see that it has like some red buttons and looks like a like a battery. And it's essentially just like your cordless drill at home. It's, you know, it's it's battery powered, it's rechargeable batteries. And so uh, when it's sitting in the truck, it's always charging. So it sits on a, on a charging dock, basically, when it when it's in there and then it has uh it has powered hydraulics you know electric electric over hydraulic power and it, it really does you know you can just sit there and push a button and lift the whole patient up off the ground you don't need two people to do that uh and whenever you go to put them in the ambulance you know, as long as you get it lined up correctly and get the get the hook in place and you have to set it set it in there a certain way it has a it has a section that pulls out from the from the ambulance hooks into the stretcher and then uh, once it's hooked in, you press a button, it lifts the wheels up, holds the stretcher in place outside of the ambulance, and brings the wheels all the way up, retracts them, and you just push it right on in. So, uh, again, a uh, huge evolution in, uh, you know, in stretchers, and, and it really helps to uh, to save on the, you know, the ambulance crew and, and those of us who assist, you know, so... Uh, those of us who assist the ambulance on a regular basis and things such as that, it, it you know it, it helps us too. So, you know, there's plenty of times. I mean, it, all the time, weekly. You know, I'm, I'm assisting an ambulance crew with with uh, loading a patient. You know, so <clears throat> you know it, it and it depends depends on what's going on. If you have multiple patients and and your your two person ambulance crew is is spread out. You know, you'll you, there's a very real possibility that you'll be assisting. You'll be on the, um, you know, you could be on the assisting end, or you could be on the actual raising end, and you know, it could be a, one of these nice, you know, Gucci type, you know, stretchers, or it could be an older one. You know, they had we had an ambulance the other day that uh, wasn't equipped with the newer stretcher, and that was an older one. So it uh, it you kind of have to be ready for each one of them. Hopefully during your skills boot camp. Uh, we'll have the ambulance come out and and bring out uh, their stretchers and everything, and you guys will get some actual hands-on time uh, lifting and moving stretchers. So again, there you know, obviously most of them are, are wheeled. Uh, you know, there are some that have tracks on them, like I was talking about the stair chair, or something something similar to that. And again, those are specialty type things and specialty areas. Uh, very few and far between, but 
Um, you know, stretchers don't like sand. Those little wheels, those little rolly wheels do not like sand and loose, loose gravel. Um, they will bog down. So having multiple people on it to keep it stabilized and move, keep it moving forward is, is almost absolutely, absolutely necessary. So the portable stretcher, this is an older version. It's just a rigid portable stretcher. So it breaks down in the middle, folds up. You can put it in a little side compartment of the ambulance or underneath the seat. Um, and, you know, it's it's good for what it is. It's not made for a long-term, you know, uh, long-distance moves. But, uh, you know, it has, a, it has a weight limit. just depends on the model. But you uh, you just have a couple straps on there. Make sure your patient just doesn't roll off. But, you know, it's just a rigid aluminum frame there and uh, and some type of, you know, uh, synthetic type material, you know, for, uh, for the bottom. And again, it's just, uh, just one of those things that's, that's easy to use other ones, uh, that are also, you'll see on the ambulance as well. Um, uh, something I carry with me all the time is a flexible stretcher and it's nothing more than just a, uh, you know, a big, um, a big mat that has handles on it. So, uh, it's soft. You can roll it up, stow it away, fold it up, put it somewhere uh, in a tight spot and keep it, uh, keep it up, tucked out of the way. Stair chairs, we mentioned this earlier, as you can see, patient has a couple seat belts in there and we have the bar in the front. We have some wheels on here. So those wheels uh, will help to kind of roll down the steps, each step that way. Uh, and then they have basically the handles at the top. And so, you know, that's an old stair chair, that picture. And, but most of them, a lot of them do operate very similar to that. And like I said, there are, I have a picture of it. They have some new, they have some new uh, uh, stair chairs that are, you know, made by Stryker and some of these other big companies that are very, uh, very nice and very easy to use. And again, use almost like little tank tracks and you can, uh, you can literally just uh, hold on to it and it'll just kind of almost guide itself down the stairs or up the stairs, mind you. So immobilization devices, uh, again, the, lo the list is long. We're going to see a few pictures here, but uh, there's a lot more to this. And uh, we'll talk about backboards and longboards and all that sort of stuff. And this will be some of your skills. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so used to immobilize patients who have neck or back injuries. Uh, used to assist in lifting patients and immobilizing lower extremity injuries. Uh, a lot of times it's just to get somebody who can't, who's, again, either has a neck or uh, back or neck injury and then uh, the patients that are just immobile, so they have lower leg injuries and can't walk, uh, just gets it's just an easier way for us to, you know, really have something solid to put them on and, and to carry them around. So we don't have to worry about it falling, you know, bending, moving, stuff like that. We can we can go from one point to another. We can slide it across stuff. We can, you know, again, if we needed to, we had long stairs, we could lower them down um, uh, using that as well. Uh, down the stairs and it's rigid it's you know, they're not going to feel it on you know coming through their back or whatever so long backboards spine boards another name for it uh used for moving patients again like to have experienced some type of trauma <clears throat> that's one version there's many new newer versions uh of spine boards out there uh, you know long boards long backboards again it has several different little nicknames but um but pretty much all of them are going to have the handles cut out like that all along it in the top and bottom. And the little white pegs you see on that one are for clips. So um, I think we're going to talk about straps here in a minute, but the, there is a, uh, again, a plethora of types of straps as well. And so you can have Velcro straps and, you know, those are supposed to be the be all to end all, you know, for, for securing a patient was these things called spider straps it's just a bunch of Velcro straps that it's all made, that's all sewn together. But really, it just ends up in a big Velcro mess uh, wherever you store it at. And it takes forever to kind of get it laid out. So uh, a lot of them were doing these quick clips where they would clip into those little white pegs. And it has basically a seat belt connection that you can adjust. And those work pretty well. So the short backboard device, this is, this is actually uh, called a KED, the Kendrick Extrication Device, KED. 
the KED is just a is a half um, half a mobilization device. There's several different uses for it, but the biggest one that it's that it's made kind of made for is the uh, seated patient in a vehicle. Okay, uh, this is something that really don't use it very often. It kind of has it needs to have its own little niche uh, for for you to use it. Uh, you really need to have somebody who's really, you know, ha- you know, seriously complaining of some some severe back pain in certain in those areas of the upper back and neck um, that are that's still in a seated position. That uh, you know, and it could necessarily be a vehicle. It could be somebody that had, you know, got got up, you know, took a blow to the back with a, um, you know, with a baseball bat or something. They just when you found them, they were still in a sitting position, and um, and we wanted to kind of you know, move them to another location or, or get them to a backboard or something like that. But the good thing about the KED is that we can, we can secure just their upper torso and, and their neck, their head and neck. So uh, the way it's, the way it's laying right there, if you look where the, where the two look like shoulder straps are coming over there, uh, essentially that part is the head. And uh, where you see the colored straps that goes around the, the upper, the, uh, the chest. And so essentially we would open that up where those buckles are and we would take that and slide it behind somebody. So wedge it behind them. And then we will uh, take those straps and start buckling, I mean, uh, tightening those straps down. We don't want to tighten them up super tight. We want to be able to get, uh, you know, some uh, fingers and and almost a a hand, a few fingers in there behind it. That uh, that's going to help us to, uh, again, kind of hold, keep everything in place while we do everything else. You can't really tell, but there's some the longer buckles uh, will that are go underneath there will go. They're kind of they're right now they're behind it, but they will go underneath the legs. So you kind of scissor them underneath the legs, and they'll come up over the top of the leg and hook around the hip area. So it encompasses the legs as well. Once they're in there like that, the last thing we're going to do is 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 uh, take that. You can use that pad if you need to, and that pad is just for the back of the head and neck. So we can fold it up, put it behind the put it behind the head, take that uh, upper part there, and wrap it around the side of the head, and then take these uh, two white straps you see here on the bottom, uh, or a head strap and a chin strap, and then uh, you know from there uh, they're pretty much in. And on each side there's a handle. And so we can put one person on each side of the patient and lift them straight up and out of wherever they're in the seated position and they're in a nice straight line. Okay, so that's the KED in a nutshell. Uh, we'll try to get our hands on one whenever we do skills. The scoop stretcher, the scoop stretcher is, uh, it's really good, you know, for, for what it is, you know, especially when you have things like, um, Serious, uh, serious spine injuries, head injuries, that th- that sort of thing, where you really don't want to move them very much, uh, or if they have pelvic uh, issues, pelvic uh, fractures and things like that are very painful. And there's also the potential for uh, bleeding in in pelvic fractures. So we, you know, again, these things where we don't want to move them very much, the scoop stretcher actually is detached, and uh, it'll it'll basically break in half. We put one, we basically, so we kind of wedge them, wedge it underneath them and we'll hook it back together. Uh, and, and again, like it, like it, like the name implies, we're going to kind of scoop them uh, in it. And, uh, and again, it's just kind of getting them from point A to point B. Okay. So we're, we're not going too far with this. It's just something, again, their legs really aren't in there very much. It's going to be mostly their upper body that we're worried about. And then uh, we're going to be able to pick them up, put them on a, on something else, put them on a backboard, put them on the stretcher or something of that nature. So you, you probably, again, you probably may have seen these two, uh, you know, in some of these emergency situations, there's, there's several different, you know, things that we can make into, um, you know, some of these different devices, doors, wood, ironing boards, you know, folding tables, uh, lawn chairs, recliner, you know, like we talked about the office chairs, surfboards, snowboards, any number of things that's out there that you can think of. 
just make sure that it's going to hold what you're what you're putting on it before you use it. So anytime a patient has a sustained a traumatic injury, suspected uh, injury to the head or neck or spine, you know that's we really have to be cautious about what we're doing as far as lifting and moving them. Um, you know, it used to be uh, for a long time it was it, it didn't matter if if the mechanism of injury involved or the patient you know was involving the head or neck or if somebody complained of any types of head or neck pain at all. They got a, a C collar, which is a plastic collar, goes around their neck. We're going to talk about that. <clears throat> and they, they were on a backboard. So if they were in a car wreck over a certain speed, if they fell from a certain height, you know, all these different things, automatically. No no questions asked for getting all that stuff. Full, call it fully spinal immobilized. And here recently, they kind of started to lax that. Not necessarily lax it, but they, they lax the restrictions on that. So... You, uh, you as the provider have a little bit more um, freedom to to make that decision, and, and it really was based off of the fact that uh, a lot of a lot of these people didn't necessarily need it. <clears throat> so the big thing was was just caught precautionary. <clears throat> Excuse me. So they were they were taking that, um, they were taking putting people on these backboards just because they you know they're like ah oh, yeah the whole thing, I don't have x-ray vision, right? I don't know what's going on with your neck. I can't tell. There's no way for me to see that. Uh, so we're just going to put you on here just in case. Well, come to find out, it was actually making things worse. So we kind of get a little bit into, you know, the re the realistic, you know, what causes these things and, and what is what is a real spine or neck injury, you know, look like. And the specialist, you know, got involved in a lot of this stuff and and so we started learning a little bit more about, uh, you know, what we, you know, what we really need to do. And that's that, uh, again, that helps us not have to put people in spine, you know, uh, full spinal restriction uh, all the time. So. <clears throat> so talking about C collars earlier, this is a cervical collar, C collar. The, uh, again, multiple different manufacturers of C collars or cervical collars. Just uh, at, at least at least three to four major ones, but there's there's plenty of other ones out there uh, that you can use. As you can see, this orange thing is like a foam one. You know, uh, obviously you may have seen some of the some of the uh, the other foam type that you would maybe get after some type of uh, you know neck procedure or something like that. Uh, spinal surgery, some, something along those lines. Uh, and then you have these plastic ones here. Uh, there's some other ones that, uh, some other specialty like sp spinal surgery type uh, stuff to, to restrict their movement. You might see uh, they're a little bit more, um, you know, a little bit more involved. They have a lot more stuff going on with them, different things, different access points for different things uh, because of the procedures that they have to do for drainage and all sorts of other stuff. But the main ones that you're going to see are going to be something similar to the the white ones there. And those are almost all of them that are on the emergency side are going to be collapsible. Okay. So they are either going to have this chin cup that you see there in the front. It's going to either flip out. Um, it's going to already be there, but it's going to lay flat. So it just moves flat. Uh, you know, there's a few different other mechanisms that, that you see out there on the market. Uh, so you really just kind of have to get used to a few different ones and make sure that you understand how they work. Once you do it a couple of times, it's, it's not a big deal. It's just, it's just to help keep them, uh, to lay flat and, and, and for storage. And so we can put them in medical bags and, uh, on the ambulance and these cabinets and stuff like that. If we had them all just like that, we would run out of room really fast. So uh, instead, we could, you know, stack 10, you know, of varying the sizes in a small space. Uh, talking about sizes, the cervical collar uh, comes in a few different uh, versions over the years. Different manufacturers have used different names. So uh, it's just one of those things, again, depends on which ones you use. Make sure that you are under, you understand which one of which one of them means and that you've read uh, the the variation of sizes. If you can kind of read there, you see the green says tall. Uh, 
there are some that, that you you refer to as no neck, and it's actually written on there as no neck. Um, some of them may say regular, short, um, you know, pediatric, you know, so and there's maybe two different sizes of pediatric. So there are, again, several different versions out there of um, of that. And so it, realistically, the, the majority that we see in most adult patients is the no neck. You know, so uh, if you kind of lean towards that, most of the time you're going to be going to be good. Uh, sometimes they may be, you know, small, medium, large, that sort of thing, extra large. Um, so just be looking at the ones that, that you're, that you have available to you. And uh, again, we'll, whenever we have skills and stuff, we'll have a few different versions to show you. Um, you know, so like I said, it just so, so many different variations out there. I can't really cover them all, but that's essentially, you know, it's going to, going to take and slide that, you're going to set it up however it's however it needs to go, whether it flips out or, you know, this one, if you look on each one of them, has like a little black dot. That little black dot actually is a, a little peg, a little plastic peg, and that peg goes in a round hole, and it has little uh, teeth on it that keep it from coming out of the hole. So you would set it up, kind of bend it a little bit, and you would flex that back part underneath the back of the neck and rotate the front around and then Velcro the other side, and that just keeps the head from going side to side. Just like this. So as you can see, this would be one of those ones that um, is a little bit more on the therapeutic side or, or you know, something that you would get from a hospital or something. Uh, it has padding on it, you know, that blue padding and that, that hard... Uh, that hard outer shell is not movable, so it doesn't fold down or anything like that. So again, that would be one of the more upscale uh, C collars, uh, not really conducive with the ones that we would use. Uh, going back to the sizing, uh, the there are some out there that have automatic sizing. So you pull a couple pins and the whole thing will kind of adjust up and down. Now, the way that we do that sizing is um, is by placing our hand uh, from on the shoulder, the shoulder of our patient, and and measure from the top of the shoulder to the bottom of the ear with our fingers. Okay, so if, if we take our fingers and if, depending on how big it is, and then we'll take that and we'll go over to the C collar and we can measure it out. So if we do have an adjustable size, uh, we're just going to take that, look and see what it is, and then we can adjust that size for that. Whenever we're doing it, we want to try to maintain manual stabilization of the head, you know, because just doing this, especially for people with long hair, men or women, um, that hair is going to get caught up in there. Uh, if it's down in their face, it's going to get caught up in the Velcro and all this other stuff. So getting the hair out of the way uh, from underneath the back of the neck, you know, holding, holding manual stabilization of the head. That way we're not pushing the head all around, that sort of thing. So again, we, we kind of mentioned some of this earlier, uh, you know, moving patients on backboards, any patient that really can't move on their own or, or has some type of head or neck injury, and we don't want to, we don't want to move them. We don't want to have them moving around. So that's when we'd use a backboard. So like we mentioned earlier, also, we want to move that patient as a unit, right, as one straight line. Uh, we don't want to try to pull the upper body and then move the lower body or grab this, grab somebody's belt and pull them from the center or whatever. We want to, you know, have a nice, smooth transition all in a straight line. Um, almost always, we're going to transport our patients face up. There are a few exceptions that we might get into uh, about patients being face down. It's really going to be uh, pretty rare, uh, but it but it can happen. Keep the patient's head or neck, and again in that straight neutral position, and uh, hopefully we can. Uh, you know, if, we're, if they're going to be on a backboard, more than likely they're going to be in a C collar. So, like we mentioned earlier as well, make sure everybody understands before we start moving. We start moving. We start moving the patient. What's going to be done? Where we're going? Where the patient is going to end up? You know that sort of thing. Let's whoever's idea it is or whoever's in charge you know let them dictate hey all right we're going to pick up the patient um on so and so's go at the head and we're going to go from here up and out up straight 
up and out over the seat and then back over onto the backboard. Okay, great. Once we get that, that's one movement. We'll get them strapped in. Okay, now we're going to take the backboard. We're going to slide it down. Once we slide it down the back of the trunk, we're going to all grab it and we're going to go feet first, you know, this way or that way or whatever, right? So a little bit of, a little bit of communication will go a long way with that. There are other short backboard devices. There's like a, hard, a half backboard uh, that you can use as well. Uh, sometimes you'll see them used for CPR, call them CPR boards. Uh, but there are some that uh, allow you just to just to put a couple of um, uh, straps on there on the chest and, and uh, stabilize them in that manner. And usually just for very, very few and far between where you even see one. They're just not used very, very much. Uh, they don't you have a ton of uses. It's kind of like I said, it has kind of more of a specific use. Log rolling, same thing we've been talking about, about, you know, you know moving them in a straight line. Uh, whenever we do our assessments, we're, you know, we want to check the entire body. We're going to roll them over, we're, you know, when trauma cases, uh, especially in, you know, um, unknown traumas and shootings and you know, stuff like that. We're going to need to, we're going to we'll call trauma naked. We're going to get them completely, all their clothes off of them, including their underwear. You know, we need to, we're going to look, you know, in at their rectum. Um, you know, we're going to look at their back, you know, all that sort of stuff. We're going to make sure that they don't have a bullet hole somewhere, you know, a puncture wound from a, from a vehicle rollover, uh, you know, a stab wound, making sure they don't have any bodily fluids coming out of holes that don't normally come out of there. You know that sort of thing. So having blood and and uh, cerebral spinal fluid coming out of the the nose and ears, you know those are things that are or that we're we're looking for, and we're going to get way more into that. But that's you know these are there's reasons that we're going to need to log roll our patient. So uh, when we do that, we're you know usually it's going to be somebody in the center, and you can do it with one person, but it's a uh, it's good to use multiple people, especially if we're having a potential spinal neck injury. The, the team of four will help to stabilize everything and bring, bring that patient uh, over to the side uh, again as one unit. So uh, somebody at the head, somebody at the shoulder, somebody at the waist, and somebody at the feet. Uh, and again, you kind of just one side or the other. Everybody gets on one side or the other except the person at the head. And they are again in charge. One, two, three, roll. They're keeping that patient's head in a neutral inline position as we roll them. And we're grabbing, you know, belt, pocket, shoulder, leg, and we're rolling them towards us. So whatever side we're on, we're going to roll them towards us. Um, barring injury. So if we have an injury on the right leg, we don't necessarily want to pull them to the right side, right? Uh, same thing, you know, maybe on the right side of the chest. We don't maybe don't want to roll them that way. So try to roll them on a side that is less injured. Okay, so roll them towards us. We'll kind of hold them in place there. Do a sweep of the back if we if we're if we're doing a quick sweep, uh, or if, or that might be the time where hey we're going to cut down the back of the shirt, cut down the back of the pants, and instead of us you know looking doing a sweep, rolling them back over, going to get the scissors, coming back. Okay, we need to roll them back over and you cut the shirt. You know what I mean? So we want to try to do as much as we can when we roll them. That way we don't have to roll them multiple times. Okay. So roll them over and um, do what you need to do. Check everything. And then uh, and then roll them back over again as a unit. One, two, three, roll. Person at the head calls it. And we lower them back down. So like we talked about straddling, right? So this is one of those things where, you know, the location of the patient just may dictate maybe a really tight hallway, tight location. We can get the, you know, might be able to get the, uh, a blanket or, or, uh, the stretcher or being you know, a stretcher, the, uh, uh, backboard, something like that in that space, but we can't really go laterally one way or the other. We can just kind of go straight up and that's it. And so this would, might be the best method, right? So again, we're in that full squatted position. We lift them up. You know, again, underneath the armpits, around the waist, legs, somebody's holding the inline stabilization of the head. Um, and then we uh, we lift straight up and get the get uh, whatever movement uh, device that we're going to use, put it underneath them, lower them straight back down. 
So again, that would be one of those times where we straddle the patient. So the straddle slide, this is one of those that um, we don't necessarily do the straddle per se as much as we just do the slide. So uh, sometimes we're able to get just part of the patient on the board and we need to move them up uh, so their whole body is, is on the board. And a lot of times what we'll do is we'll have somebody holding C-spine like that, holding their head, holding their, uh, the head, and then we'll take and uh, from the side, we'll grab their shoulders, hips, and we'll move them up the uh, up the board by sliding them. <clears throat> so we talked about buckles for a second earlier. That's, again, a multiple, multitude of different types of ways that they can do it. it just depends on, you know, what uh, ambulance service or what fire department or whatever, you know, whose stretcher you're using or whose backboard you're using. So they can be again those little clips that look that hook into those um those little tabs or they could be uh cinched through the handles they could be um hard you know put in there permanently uh they have some that circumference the whole thing so they go through one handle they go underneath the board then they go back around and out through another handle and they come back across the the patient those are not those are not the best just because you can't really slot them very much and all that. And they're going to get caught on stuff. But if that's all you have, that's one way to do it. You know, it, 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 it can work. Uh, another version of that is that it goes underneath the patient. So the patient is basically laying on the strap. The strap goes underneath, uh, down and out on both sides and comes back around on top of them. So it, it encompasses the handle so it can't move. So that's the other version of that. So, again, tons of straps out there. Uh, the seat belt version is a very popular one that you'll see a lot. Uh, you know, there are some that have little flip buckles, almost like a um, like an aircraft. Uh, you might see it in an aircraft uh, buckle, and there are some of those. Uh, the ones on the actual stretcher you'll see uh, are similar to that as well, and they have um, they may have three, four, five, you know, five straps, you know, so legs, hips, chest, and then you have two that come over the, um, the shoulders from the top of the stretcher, uh, the like ration, uh, seat belts, you know, so that just helps keep that patient, you know, from, from sliding off, you know, especially if they're getting a rollover or something like that helps keep the upper torso really, uh, uh, in place. If the if the vehicle if the stretch if the ambulance or something like that were to roll over or if the patient were to roll over in the the um, um, ambulance. So generally, when we are strapping somebody down to the backboard, it is going to be uh, the pelvis, upper legs, uh, you know that area first. Okay, and then we're going to do the head last. All right, we don't want to do the head first because it's, if at some point we're doing that and the patient happens to slide off, then their head is strapped down, their body's not, and it could potentially be very damaging to them. So uh, torso, legs, that sort of thing first, and then the head. So head immobilization, uh, we talked about seat collar a little bit. That's that's one way. Um, the actual uh, securing of the head, though, to the backboard is another thing. Uh, the blanket roll is is uh, one of those things that we can use with a lot of different stuff. We could use clothing to do it. We can use a blanket, a towel, all sorts of different things. Kind of needs be, be, it needs to be fairly large uh, to do it. Uh, you need a good bit of material. However, essentially, we just roll make a roll from each end and have it meet in the middle and these are these are commercial ones here so um you're again not going to see these very often uh we just don't have these type around here um but that that blanket roll or something similar to that is what you're going to see on the ambulance more more often is going to be some type of commercially made like product that like sticks down to the board or uh, goes next to their head and they, they, they strap them down that way. 
There are, uh, again, tons of these different types of things out there. Uh, but uh, there's, you know, in the military a long time ago, it was taking, taking the boots off the patient, fill them with sand, and put it next to their head. Okay, so, I mean, if you, if you think way outside the box here, if you think about wilderness medicine or anything like that, you know, there, there, you, can, you can get really creative with, with stuff to try to make, uh, make it so their head can't go side to side. But again, uh, essentially, once we get them on the board, before we put their head straps on them, we'll take and put something on either side of their head. And then we will, um, that helps relieve the person who has been holding their head the whole time. And then, as you can see here in um, the bottom left picture, we're going to put that head, put a head strap on them. A lot of times, uh, if you're in or around AAA, you're going to have two color-coded pieces of duct tape a yellow and a red. One of them will say head and one of them will say chin. The head one will have a piece of foam in the middle of it that's attached to it. And so you'll take that you'll take that one, put that foam in the center of the head, wrap it all the way around and all the way and up and under the board. So usually up and up and underneath the handle. So it's nice and secure. So it secures the head on both sides. And then you'll take your chin. Your chin will start on one side, go down, around, and underneath the C collar or underneath the chin, and down and back up to the other uh, side. So almost forming a little X on the side of the head. Any questions on any of that? There, like I said, it, it'll make more sense when we really get to get in here. We're going to go over a few more slides um, that are specifically uh, in reference to the skills. So, I mean, just a second, we'll get these transferred over. But these are um, these are we're going to talk a little bit more about the, the actual skill of what we've just been talking about. So, any questions on any of that, real quick? None. What are you planning on trying to do the skills test? So the uh, the skills are going to be at the end of class. Once we get done with all the all this stuff, uh, we'll 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 decide on a on some days that are good for you guys. Uh, in keeping with this type of class, and especially for the the, the students that we have in this class. Uh, most of you guys, you know, working during the day or, or you know, being volunteers or something like that, uh, want to try to make it as easy as we can. So we'll probably do it on a weekend uh, or, or uh, probably two weekends. And uh, it'll be like an all-day Saturday, maybe half a day sa Sunday type thing. And uh, and we'll, we'll kind of figure that out once it gets closer and see what works best for everybody. And you know, we we'll try to get that ironed out. If we need to do it a couple times, we can try to do that. Or if we have some people that, you know, I know some of the cops in the room are going to, uh, you know, they work nights and, and rotating shifts and stuff like that. So we're probably going to have to have uh, a little sidebar for, for some of them as well. So, you know, for those of you who may not be able to make it on those, who may try to do it uh, whenever we do theirs, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, maybe evenings or something like that during the week or something along those lines, whatever works for everybody. But, uh, but either way, we'll, we'll get through it and, and make sure that, uh, that everybody gets their, their skills checked off. All right. So these, like I said, we're not too many of these and we'll be done for the night, but, uh, these are some of the, the things that we had talked about uh, and some of the other skills that are that are included uh, here, but uh, this is the uh, direct ground lift. And like, like I said, it's, it's one of those where we're kind of, we're just taking that patient and we don't suspect a, a head or neck injury, but we're just going to pick them straight up and, and bring them somewhere. And maybe we can only get to them from the side, something of that nature. And so again, right there at the, you can see where their hands are in the first picture. Slide them right up underneath the patient in those locations, underneath the underneath the waist and the neck, and then the uh, the hips and the knees, and we're gonna do a squat and come straight up. Okay. And again, it's usually just for a short distance lift. Set them down somewhere else. 
So again, talking about the scoop stretcher earlier, as you can see, like I said, it comes apart. We're going to slide it up underneath there on one side, slide it up underneath, and maybe do a little bit of a log roll there on one side, scoop, uh, again, like it says, scoop them in there, and then uh, reattach it. Make sure it's reattached firmly, attach the straps to it. It's another way to secure it. And then from there, they're going to, uh, you can take them wherever you need to go in a short distance. So the KED, Kendrick Extrication Device, this is similar to what we were talking about. Uh, if, especially in this, um, in this configuration, if you have somebody that can get behind them and hold manual C-spine, that's fantastic. If not, definitely a C-collar uh, just to help prevent them from moving their neck. A lot of times, uh, if we want to stabilize their neck and we don't have a, we don't, we, if we just let them kind of hang out there on their own, they will start looking at us. They'll looking at what we're doing. They'll, they'll want to turn their head naturally and look. And so we want to try to uh, keep them from doing that. But as you can see in the center picture, he's sliding it down back behind her, her back and then wrapping that, wrapping around her chest. And it's going to be right up underneath her armpits. So um, the sequence is bottom to top there. And we're going to start at the bottom, work our way up, snugging them up tuck our straps in again we want to make sure that we can get some, a few fingers behind those straps and it's not so tight uh, but it's snug enough to where we can um, you know where she's not moving around and then like i said we'll take that pad put it down behind back of her neck uh, back of her head fill that gap that's back there and we'll take those velcro straps just like we just talked about on the backboard and wrap those those velcro straps around there <clears throat> sometimes if you have an older one those velcro straps are wore out they don't hardly do anything so not a bad idea to uh, take some tape and do what we just did on the on the backboard and just go all the way around the back side and make it stick um, to the back of the KED and that way you, you're making sure that those chin and head strap don't pop off so the four person log roll like we said before um, you know, we also want to, you know, kind of, you know, hold on to their arm if we, if it's just flopping around. So if they're completely unconscious, but as you can see, that person is holding the head, they have their hands, their hands kind of spread out like that, or their fingers spread out and they're, they're almost right over their ears, um, right, to, right, right above their ears. And we're not pressing really hard, but we're just keeping everything in line. And whenever they go to roll over, we're keeping that head in a neutral position. So don't let it hang down. Same way with the backboard, if we're going to log roll them, log roll them for the, and put them on the backboard, which is something that we do fairly frequently. Uh, you know, do, do your log roll as usual. And then uh, somebody's just going to be operating that backboard, kind of wedge it uh, as far as they can get there uh, underneath them. And then whenever we go to roll, we're going to roll back as a unit. And, um, and that person is going to keep a little tension forward so that person doesn't kick that board out. Uh, again, you may have to adjust them a little bit, like we talked about sliding them. So if we do that, usually it's going to be an up and over motion at the same time. But we're going to uh, hold their hips, hold their, uh, hold their you know, shoulders, and kind of move them up and over and center them on the board. So like we mentioned before, talking about the blanket roll, we're going to take and, and fold it over multiple times, and then we're going to roll it over um, from one from one end to the other on both sides and make uh make those little pieces on each end that way it'll and you would set the patient's head in between those two rolls and put it around their head okay um you know if and again that's one of those things where you know if you if you're on a budget especially or or you have a disaster kit or something like that this is a great little thing that you can pre-make um as you can see in that first picture there they got some gauze and some other things and maybe even some tape or something uh, that they have stored in there. And so you could roll it up, store that stuff in there, wrap it up. And now you have, now you have a little bundle, a little head roll bundle. And I mean, realistically, you could use that for a ton of different things. When you get into banding and splinting, you know, you'll see, you know, we, we can kind of get creative with a lot of things and you, know, you could use that for a head roll. You could use it to stabilize a knee or an elbow, um, you know, a lot of different things. So, or, or you could use it to unfold it and use the blanket to carry somebody with or drag so
So applying the blanket roll again, it's it's really not much different. We're going to make sure we put that um, C collar on there, and uh, first, and then once we do that, we just kind of ever so gently lift our head up, slide that up underneath there, and then just like we did before, we're going to do a head strap and a chin strap. All right, so like I said, just a few more, just to kind of give you some more pictures, give you a little bit more idea of what we're dealing with there. Um, anybody have any questions or anything that we've covered tonight? No, it's not a, not a ton of slides tonight, but um, again, stuff that kind of needs to be focused on because it's something we do quite often. So the uh, big thing to recap is the, you know, lifting and moving patients is, you know, don't get in a rush to do it, you know, unless it's an emergency. But even then, you know, you need to be, you know, think, try to think quickly about what you're going to need to do uh, to, to make it so it's not going to hurt you. OK, uh, those are that's a big deal and uh, it can go downhill real fast. OK, um, so especially if you're there by yourself or it's just a couple people and, and you're really having to, you know, trying to get a big patient. Um, especially a big patient moved around in a, in a tight location or trying to pick them straight up and that sort of thing, you know, it's difficult. It, it is not easy. Um, you know, we get in these precarious positions, especially, and I go keep going back to vehicle accidents because that's just what we deal with so much is vehicle accidents. And, and this is where you find patients in a lot of crazy positions. So uh, when you're dealing with stuff like that, it, it's, uh, it's paramount that you call for extra help early uh if you're if you know that that patient is probably gonna have to come out on a backboard or come out with some type of assistance um you know it's always good to have extra hands there you know if you don't need them you don't need them not a big deal but uh but when you do need them you need them right now you know we don't need to wait and wait for somebody to come from the station to, to come and assist you know so call for that help and call for it early uh save your it'll save your back and maybe your career you know so unless you want to sit there and type on a computer you know, instead of being a, being an EMT or a first responder or a firefighter or something like that, you know, you know, again, it's, it's happened to people and it, it didn't, and a lot of times it doesn't take very much to do that. It, it could be something very simple. So, all right. Any questions on anything tonight? Was this one recorded also? It is recorded and we'll, we'll uh, cross our fingers and hope that it'll get uploaded. Um, but if not, again, it's probably one of the, it's just my computer, uh, guys and girls. It's, uh, it has some kind of issue with, uh, with freezing up here recently. So I gotta, uh, I gotta try to get it fixed, um, here pretty soon. So I apologize for that, uh, Tuesday, but like I said, like Rob said, it's, uh, pretty much the same stuff, uh, on these early chapters It's pretty much all the same stuff for everything you do. And, um, you know, until we kind of, they, they're going to start to ex, ex, exceed some of the things that you guys can do. So they'll, they'll kind of take, uh, run, run away from you a little bit, but these first few chapters are, are pretty very similar. So uh, be looking for that uh, tomorrow, you know, tomorrow morning or whatever, uh, or late tonight. Cool. All right. Cool. So, so your code, your code for tonight is going to be R002. Okay, so R three zeros and a two. That'd be your class code for tonight. Gotcha. So read your chapters. Does it matter if the R? Huh? Does it matter if the R is capitalized or not? Uh, I don't think so. Okay, because I typed it in last night and I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, I don't think it is. Uh, so. It's, um, you know, read your chapters, right? Uh, you know, if you have your skill sheet, the skill sheets, the, the, um, the skill sheets for these are not in the national registry skills. These are, these are skills come from the other ones. Like I said, I, I promise I'll get those out as soon as I can, uh, to a format to where you can retrieve them. Um, and so you can, you can look at all these different skills whenever you, whenever you get a chance. But, um, like I said, Whenever we get to that point, we'll, we'll make sure that you're all well, warm and fuzzy and comfortable with uh, with all these skills. So if nobody else has anything, um, that's it for tonight. I appreciate it. Like I said, make sure you take this time, take this extra little time tonight and, you know, read through your chapter. So take your quiz whenever you get a chance. All right. Good night, everybody.
All right. See you. Good night. See you.